Hi everybody, it's Michaela Beyer and today I am interviewing Les Riggs. Les Riggs was the drummer of Cat House and the Crybabies, but probably the band that he's best remembered for is Cheap and Nasty with his bandmate Nasty Suicide of Hanoi Rocks. We're gonna go over his entire career, his upbringing and what makes him continue making music today even while he juggles it with another career. Thank you so much for coming on, Les. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Thank you. All righty, so let's start at the beginning. Where were you born and raised? So um, I was born in a sleepy little burg named Salem, Oregon, which is the capital of Oregon. Um, it's where I live now. And um, I've been back here for about 20 years. But um, when, I, when I was born here, um, you know, the population is pretty small. There wasn't a whole lot of culture here. Um, and it was the kind of place that I just, I couldn't wait to get out of. But I also spent some time, uh, we, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, uh, you know, basically, you know, chaos was ever present and, you know, had uh, a lot of um, uh, ups and downs, all that kind of stuff. But we spent some time in Alaska and um, also spent some time in California for a little bit. And um, then back here, graduated from high school here. And then um, as soon as I did that, moved down to LA. Nice. As quickly now, as possible. <laughs> Um, how did your Native American heritage influence your exposure to music while you were growing up? Well, I mean, you know, so I was around the powwow drum as a youth. And so, you know, there's that heartbeat, you know, Mother Nature's heartbeat. And, and I think that that, um, you know, I've always kind of had an innate sense of rhythm, you know, and, and I think that that had a lot to do with that, you know, being around that and um, having that influence. And, um, you know, it also kind of... Um, I don't know. I think it just kind of it it had an impact on me, um, you know, in, in the way that I viewed the world and the way that I, you know, like um, uh, sort of experienced things, you know. And so uh, but music was was one of those things for me that, um, you know, was 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 just my kind of my refuge, you know. I mean, I, I there were stories about me as like a four year old walking around with this little play school record player with a stack of 45s and I just sit there for hours on end, you know, over and over side A, side B, you know, and, and go through the lot and then, you know, and then, you know, shuffle them re again and go through them again. And, you know, and some, you know, great stuff, you know, Tommy James and the Shondells, you know, that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, I love all that, you know, 60s bubble gum stuff. And, and, um, and that, that was a, a major influence on me too, you know, just as far as, um, you know, uh, that that just you know music has always been a constant companion and probably my best friend you know it's uh, it's never let me down you know so exactly and it was probably doubly so considering how many times you moved yeah yeah you know I mean and and but it, what's interesting too is that you know I grew up um, on you know AM radio country you know 60s and 70s country and that like that's another thing that had a, a big influence on me too because that was always you know, that sound, you know, was always wafting through the radio, you know, throughout the, the home. And, and um, so that just that vibe, you know, was another thing that had a, a sort of a major impact on me too, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. So can you remember the first time you actually sat down at a drum kit? I can. Um, before that, uh, just a little bit of a preview. Um, before actually sitting down at a drum set, I was obsessed with the drums and, um, and obsessed with drummers and um, would like, uh, I had a pair of sticks. And so like, I'd, we had these long cushions on our sofa and I'd like pull those cushions off and, and I'd, I'd play along to the, you know, to the songs on these cushions. <laughs> and, <laughs> Nice. So, which was a little bit, you know, bit easier on the ears than, you know, when the, when the drum kit started showing up, but I actually, uh, I think I was in like, um, seventh or eighth grade, you know, sort of like 14 ish. And, um, a friend of mine was a drummer and he played drums in the jazz band at school. And, um, so he was a lot more, you know, um, serious about it and, and had, had been doing it for a while. And, and so, I had him come over and spend the night at my house. And what we didn't tell, you know, my parents was that he was bringing his drum set. <laughs> and so uh, the drum set shows up, we got it set up in my room. And of course, you know, um, I could, I mean, I, I could immediately, when I sat down, I could do it. You know, um, I got, you know, like I said, I wasn't, you know, as experienced as my friend was, but you know, it was, um, I mean, I could play like easy rudimentary things and, and, and that was it, you know, um, 
I, I'd already, I was already sold on the drums. I just hadn't, you know, really experienced what that was really like to sit down and do that. And um, so, yeah, that was the, the first time. And then, it, you know, it's never, never ended as you can see, still have them behind me, yeah. get on them, you know, as often as possible and, you know. What a wonderful story. It sounds like you just had a bit of a natural talent right from the get go. Yeah, well, I think that the practice on the cushions helped. And so who were some drummers that you admired when you originally started playing? Well, um, probably my favorite drummer uh, from that time, uh, favorite drummers probably would have been um, Bunny Carlos from Cheap Trick, uh, mm -hmm. who's still a, a, a favorite of mine, Roger Taylor from Queen, um, you know, and then a little later, uh, Tommy Ramone, um, you know, and, and um, Paul Cook from the Pistols and, and um, the Ramones. And, and uh, you know, once that kind of stuff started creeping in, Rat Scabies, um, you know. And then the, um, probably my, my biggest influence um, as I got a little older, probably around 16, was a guy called Bill Stevenson from a band called The Descendants. Yeah. And um, I, his style is just, it's, it's um, he, he a lot of tom fills a lot of floor tom a lot of symbols you know and um and he just and and plus he wrote songs too and there were these like really super confessional songs you know and 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 that you know that kind of thing um had a major impact on me as far as songwriting was concerned too you know but but drummers i mean you know it, there were so many neil pert of course was like a, a favorite you know and I, I loved rush and and um that whole vibe and but I had super like eclectic tastes, you know, like Charlie Benante from Anthrax was another one that, you know, and, and back then I was, you know, I'm, I'm a small town kid and, 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 um, you know, kind of, uh, I'd had the 13 piece Ludwig Vista light set, you know, the, you know, and, um, with the mirrored bass drum heads and all that stuff, you know, and, and was like super into, you know, that kind of stuff playing as fast and flashy as I could, you know, and then um, John Bonham was was another major one that um, I mean, he actually, you know, through listening to Led Zeppelin records and playing along to Led Zeppelin records was like kind of what really sort of really taught me how to play. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried um, drum lessons and I got kicked out because um, the uh, the instructor, I could do everything by ear. I didn't I had no interest in reading music. I'm like, dude, I just want to play along to Led Zeppelin records and Ramones records. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to play in a jazz band or any of that kind of stuff or classical or, you know, I don't want to be a percussionist. I want to be a rock and roll drummer, you know? And so, but basically he caught me looking out the window when I was supposed to be reading music. And so I said, you, you got to go, you know, you're not, you're not serious. <laughs> and before I forget, of course, I have to mention one other drummer who had a massive impact on me as a, as an early teen was uh, Razzle. You know, when I um, first heard um, uh, Hanoi Rocks, um, oddly enough, the first album I ever heard by them was All Those Wasted Years, the live album. You know, uh -huh. and I and I saw a DVD of that. And when I saw that DVD, I was like, you know, um, like I said, I'm gonna, you know, come from a small town, a very conservative place, and and at that time I did. I had really long hair. Was very you had I wore flashy clothes, there were a lot of girls' clothes, you know, that kind of stuff, and had to, you know, get in fights and, you know, defend myself and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, because there are a lot of idiots, you know. Yeah. And uh, the most confusing thing to me was that sometimes the rednecks would drive by and they'd yell out, hey, Devo. And I love Devo, but I was like, why are you, I have, I've got long hair, why don't you call a guy with the Mohawk Devo? But, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, morons. But, um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, so I can't, cannot, you know, um, not uh, go down that list of drummers without mentioning Razzle, you know, and of course, Hanoi Rock's impact on me. Wonderful. And um, one thing I'm curious about is, um, it, it kind of sounds like drums were naturally your instrument of choice. Did you ever consider playing another instrument or was it pretty much strictly always, I'm going to be a rock and roll drummer? No, I actually, um, the first instrument I played was uh, trumpet. And oh. um and I, I tried uh, playing trumpet and, um, and, but then, you know, it was in a drum and bugle core. And so I was always looking over at the drummers, you know, I'm like, you know, and so it, it didn't stick and, and um, it, I, it didn't really, it wasn't something I really wanted to pursue. And then once I got in, into the, the drum line, then I was like really happy, you know, so I was like playing uh, bass drum, tom, snare, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's when I learned how to flip the sticks and all that kind of thing. And, and, um, 
you know uh so yeah but but then i um i i did uh teach myself how to play guitar um because i uh i wanted to write songs you know and so you can't really i mean i suppose you could write songs on the drums and maybe there's probably people that do it but you know i didn't really know how to do that and so i needed to figure out a way you know to to do that and so um you know the fortunately for me you know, I got to live with some of the best guitar players on the planet. You know, I shared many houses with or flats or apartments or whatever you want to call them with Tim O'Caltio, who mm -hmm. of course was an amazing guitar player. Yeah. Uh, Daryl Bath, you know, I lived with him for a little while and, and Nasty Suicide, you know, I mean, some, you know, some serious pickers, you know, and so um, I, I was very fortunate. And uh, we had a, with, um, during Cheap and Nasty, we had a deal with um, Gibson and Fender, and so we got like you know um, uh, retail prices and not retail prices, but whatever the I don't know what the hell the term is or whatever. But we basically we got cheap guitars, and so I, I went and picked out this thin line uh, Telecaster that I'd had until just a few years ago, but it it was sitting collecting dust, and I thought that thing needs to be played. It was such a special guitar. And so, um, you know, the other thing was, was that when we got our publishing advance, we all went and bought home studios, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, and I immediately, uh, you know, went to work and knew, you know, knew some, you know, um, uh, chords and, and, you know, that's when I wrote Living a Lie, uh, was, uh, you know, in, in um, pre, pre deal, no, no, post deal, you know, with, uh, with Cheap and Nasty. And then that ended up on the Beautiful Disaster record, of course. So, which is a shocker to me. I mean, I didn't, when I brought it to the guys, I thought they're just going to laugh at me, you know, but uh, they didn't. And uh, we recorded it and there it is. So and it's a beautiful song. I love it. Oh, thank you. All righty. So when you were still in school, did you ever find an outlet for your musical talent um, actually in school? Like, did you join marching band or anything like that? So, yeah, as I was uh, saying earlier, I was on the drum and bugle corps thing. That was a uh, 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 that wasn't a school thing. That was a thing called the Argonauts. It was a different it was an organization, you know, that had been around for a while. I did try, um, you know, to to do percussion in the um, in the orchestra, you know, and I, I I lasted a little while. But it was another one of those things. It just wasn't really it didn't hold my interest. I didn't have any interest in the music at that time. You know, I was. Um, you know, way more into like jamming along to Dirty Rotten Imbeciles records and stuff like that. Like I just, I didn't have any, you know, any, you know, it didn't, it didn't nowadays, you know, and, 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 you know, for a very long time now, I, I have a great love for classical music and jazz and, 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 um, and, you know, those kinds of things. But when I was young, it's just kind of a snotty kid, you know what I mean? And I just, well, I was into what I was into and, um, you know, and it, it just didn't, it didn't make it for me, you know, so I tried it, you know, and I learned how to read music and I, I you know, I, I did some work on the timpanis and stuff like that, which was cool and, and which I'm glad I did because later on I ended up playing some timpanis on a recording for some friends and so, you know, having that experience and knowing how to do it was a good thing, you know, but um, yeah, no, I just wanted to rock out. Cool. And um, in that vein, um, how did you decide once and for all that you that music was going to be your career? I mean, were you already in college by then or was it straight from high school to moving to Los Angeles? Straight from high school. Um, so right after I graduated, uh, I um, basically just went to work. I was working in like a cannery, you know, to save money. And um, I come from a very poor family. So uh, no, when I finally did um, graduate from university, I, I was the only gra university graduate in my entire family on mother's and father's side since then my uh, my sister's gone to school and she's gotten a degree and uh, my oldest brother now after he retired um he's uh, now at school he wants to uh, be a nurse and that so but it just it, you know it, my options were get a job or join the army you know and i'm not army material you know so um so basically no i mean as soon as i graduated i knew exactly what i wanted to do there was no way I was going to do anything in this town or even Portland at that time in Portland, there was nothing, you know, I mean, we had um, uh, quarter flash. I don't know if you've ever heard of quarter flash, but I have <laughs> heart in my heart, I think is the song, but, and, and no disrespect. I mean, it was a great song. They got a ton of radio play good for them, you know, but uh, there's no scene, you know, and uh, there was, I mean, there was kind of a, a, like, you know, the wipers and there was a punk scene and that kind of stuff, but that was kind of off my radar. At that time, I was at that uh, time, I was really focused on glam rock, 
you know, and, and um, I mean, I, hate, I really don't like that term, but, you know, but that's, you know, the kind of music I was listening to. Those were the kind of people I was hanging out with. And that's the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And so, you know, at that time in 86, LA was the place to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a, um, the fortunate uh, circumstance that a friend of mine um, that I actually ended up moving to LA with went down the year before and he met a bunch of people. He just went and hung out at the clubs. He just went and hung out at Rock and Roll Denny's and, and um, just started meeting people and talking to them about what he wanted to do. And uh, so he came back with a suitcase full of phone numbers and, and uh, stuff. And, and um, so I, uh, that's when we started forging our plan at that time, our plan at that time, myself and him, his name's Mike um, and our friend Kelly Lemieux who plays bass in Buckcherry now um, and who's just an amazing bass player. Um, he uh, and, and a, another friend of ours named Jeff um, who got into like doing commercials and stuff like that. And, and, and then I, is still there and, and is, has managed to make a pretty good living. Um, and uh, this other guy, Lee, who was already living down there, um, let us come down and crash at his place. So he lived in a place called Midway City, um, you know, kind of Huntington Beach-ish, I guess, if I remember correctly, but it was a long time ago. I can't really remember. And plus we were, you know, pretty drunk most of the time. Um, he, uh, so he let us crash on his floor and got us jobs at this, uh, this plumbing <laughs> parts warehouse where we'd stand for eight hours a day and put plastic plumbing parts into plastic bags and seal them and throw them in a box. It was mind numbing and, and um, soul destroying work. And, um, but, you know, we managed to then save up some, some cash to, you know, make the move to Los Angeles. And so um, during that time, I started um, getting to know a couple of the guys that Mike met when he was there, you know, um, when he went down the year before. And one of the guys turned out to be a guy called Randy Blair, who's just a, an insane guitar player, super talented guy, and um, was into Hanoi, was into, you know, the dolls and, and, then, and then all the other, you know, punk rock and skate punk and that kind of stuff that I was into too. And so we got super tight real fast. And, and, um, and he was um, buddies with, these, with, the, with the guys in Cat House. And so, um, I don't, and, uh, you know, do you want me to go into all that now, or you want to wait, or? or... Um, I, I'd love it if you went into that. We're, we're going at a good pace, so go right ahead. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so he um, was friends with those guys. He knew them from his hometown. <clears throat> and so Cat House had been going for a while, um, you know, before I joined them. They, had, they previously were called China, and actually before that, they were called Barbie, but Mattel put a, gave him a cease and desist order, and so... Um, they had to quit that. And then eventually um, some of those guys um, became a band called Virgin. And, wow. um, and I think Virgin might have made a record or two. I can't remember. But um, the guitar player from that group from, from China went on to do that. And I think they might have gotten a cease and desist order too or sued or whatever. But, um, you know, I think they were trying to court con controversy with that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, there was another great band around that time called New Improved God. And they had these fantastic t-shirts of, of like Mickey Mouse being crucified and stuff. It's fantastic. But um, so anyway, so uh, my buddy, uh, Randy, um, he uh, had these friends uh, from the Valley, um, a bunch of guys that um, they were trying to put a group together. They needed a drummer and a second guitar player. So we uh, went and, and uh, jammed with those guys and it turned out to be a cool thing. And and um, so that band was called Skin on Skin. And um, we did one show at the Roxy opening for uh, a bunch of kids called Polo. Um, and I think Josh Freeze, um, the amazing drummer Josh Freeze, I think if I remember correctly, was, was drumming with that band at that time. And of course he's gone on to do like amazing and wonderful things. But um, <clears throat> so yeah, so that was uh, you know one gig and then um, that kind of brought me to the attention of, of Cat House. They saw me play. Um, they liked what I did. And so um, they uh, came down and had a chat with me and said, hey, we got this thing going and you know, you want to come check it out? So I said, sure. So um, at that time, they were a four piece. So they booted their drummer and then brought me and Randy. And then so Randy and I joined Cat House and we started um, headlining clubs. So immediately my, my foray into uh, the LA club scene was I was headlining, you know, one support show at the Roxy and then headlining the Whiskey, the Roxy, the country club, the, you know, 
all that stuff. So I got very lucky, you know, my, my other buddies, they, they weren't so lucky. They didn't, you know, a couple of them moved back home and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and then of course, you know, with Kelly, you know, he was doing great stuff. He was in a band called the electric love hogs and um, that I, I played some, I played drums with them for a little bit too. And, um, you know, but that wasn't really my scene. It was that, you know, I, I love them. They're great. You know, but it was that kind of funk metal stuff and, which is, you know, which is great. And they did it well, they did it very well, you know, um, but, um, and of course, Kelly's amazing and talented, but um, I, I was, you know, super focused on the, the cat house thing. And, and, um, and then, uh, but that was, you know, just kind of was um, flogging a dead horse at one point, you know, and our singer had a terrible alcohol problem and, and um, was super unreliable. And, you know, he'd get so drunk before shows, you couldn't really sing and, you know, and, and, um, and so we had labels that, you know, were looking at us, but because of his, you know, his behavior, they, they didn't really want to take a chance and which is really sad because he was like, you know, he, he was one of those guys that was a diehard and, and unfortunately he did end up passing away a while back, um, you know, oh. he got into harder stuff and, you know, and uh, so it's really sad, you know, tragic I'm sorry story. I'm that, that's awful. Yeah, you know, and his brother, actually, um, I'm still in touch with him. He was the guitar player in Cat House too. He's um, really great guitar player, super nice guy. And, and um, you know, so it felt really bad for him, you know, losing his brother like that. And, um, but, you know, it just, for me, it was like, it was one of those things I just kind of knew I had a feeling like this isn't going to get anywhere, you know? And, um, and uh, oddly enough, like I found some demos, some guy in, the Netherlands was selling our demos. And so I, I reached out to him and I said, Hey, you know, I was the drummer on that. Could I get a copy for free? <laughs> and he's like, sure. So he sent me one and I listened to it and I'm like, I get it. I now I understand why it, you know, it wasn't working because it wasn't that good, you know, uh, and, and live, I mean, live, it was a spectacle and we did a thing. I mean, I, I remember one time we were doing a show and his name was Clark and Clark was really into um, the, the, you know, the, the pageantry of the whole thing. And, and, um, I remember one time we were um, we were going to do a show at the whiskey, and so we're driving to practice, and um, we stop at the post office, and he jumps out of the tr out of the tr we were driving a truck. He jumps out of the truck, and goes over to the thing, yanks the flag off of the post office wall, chucks it in the back of the truck, <laughs> jumps in, and then heads off to rehearsal. And um, so I'm like, you know, what in that on earth is he going to do with that flag? You know, so. Um, so he goes, so we get to the show. And he's like, all right, you guys, you know, drag out the intro, you know, to the, to the first song, you know? And so we, we do. And, and um, at the whiskey, there's like stairs that lead down um, to the stage. And, and uh, I look over and he's like walking down <laughs> stairs with this fucking flag <laughs> and uh, with this helmet on that says like, you know, war is peace and you know, all these slogans and stuff. And, and he used to make his own clothes. He's a fantastic, you know, sewer and he made these amazing outfits and he was just such a you know committed guy and I felt so bad for him that he never was able to like really you know do something with music because I mean he did have a talent you know mm -hmm. and um and and he wrote good songs too some of those songs were really good and and uh you know but um yeah it just it I could tell you know just so I started kind of putting feelers out and you know um, I ended up in this band called the Couch Sluts and um, so I met, met a couple of guys, um, a New Yorker and this guy from San Francisco. And, um, uh, you know, basically what we were all about was just like um, seeing how much bourbon we could consume, you know, and then go play a show. And, and uh, so we first were called the Beefy Bourbon Squirts. Mm -hmm. And we did one show. Um, back in those days, they had this, these things called the No Bozo Jams at the um, the whiskey. And it was basically, it was a industry night where you know the suits could come down you got three songs you got 15 minutes you know what I mean and to mm -hmm. do your best material and so they can you know so basically the industry could say you know say you know it looks good whatever maybe they come have a conversation with you, whatever so we thought that that was the dumbest thing ever mm. and so we thought we're gonna get you know <laughs> three songs together and go play this no bozo thing and um so we did and um we proceeded to you know, pound as much bourbon as we could. We get there and, you know, there's a couple fights backstage and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and, uh, cause there was pizza was being brought in. So the bass player decided that he was going to hoard all the pizza, you know? And so, 
anyway plus there was like free beer and stuff too so like you know we just kept going so anyway we get down to play and um first song goes okay i think we did back in the ussr you know by the beatles or you know some movie was all like beatles cheap trick kind of stuff you know that was what we were all into and and uh yeah and um but done in kind of a punkish kind of way and and um but we all had kind of the paisley look you know too is all that kind of thing and and uh you know a goofy name and um i remember the the mc like beefy bourbon squirts i mean it was all like really pathetic you know mm -hmm. and so um but midway through the second song the singer decided to grab onto the bass player's shirt and trousers and launched him into the audience and it was like the parting of the red sea and he just went bam and broke his bass in two he got concussed and then um all we were worried about was where was our Jim Beam? You know, so we go down, we get our buddy out and they're they're throwing us out, like physically tossing us out of the whiskey. And um, so, you know, fists are flying and, you know, we're, you know, trying to grab our bourbon, you know, we're, and, and, and uh, trying to, um, you know, save face a little bit. And, um, and so the whole crowd is yelling, bozos, bozos, bozos. And I think it was one of my proudest moments. Oh my gosh. And, um, so we had a great time and uh, but that became the couch sluts and um and uh but that was like right around the time um i met uh, the cheap and nasty guys and so um they got really serious and um the guy um the main the singer who was the main songwriter um his name was roxy he was a man called sybil um san francisco band called sybil who were great and um kind of a uh Steve Bader's kind of thing you know um but uh, he had his he had really had his own thing and um but they started writing serious songs and um you know um that's after we did one more show at the coconut teaser kind of in the jokey thing we were doing like Neil Diamond stuff we um they used to have at the coconut teaser on Sundays they'd have these um jams and and uh there there'd be like free beer and hot dogs and um, so we'd be sitting there waiting at like, you know, seven o'clock on the steps, waiting for the doors to open so we could go eat and have a beer. Because mm -hmm. none of us, you know, were, we didn't have any money, you know. Yeah. And uh, so we did one, one, more, one more of those jokey shows and we did, a, we rewrote um, uh, Peace Sells, So Who's Buying into Beer Sells, So Who's Buying. And um, it was all <laughs> about waiting in line at the keg and all that kind of stuff. And it was great, you know, it was great fun. And, <clears throat> you know not but not something you know i never wanted to be weird al yankovic you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh so um but yeah it was it was it was great you know uh for that time i was young i was like you know i wasn't even 21 yet i think it was like 19 or 20 that maybe 20 i think and um so that's another story i got kicked out of my own 21st birthday because i was stupid enough to ask the promoter uh, if i could hold my 21st birthday at the coconut teaser where i'd been playing illegally for two years Oh my gosh. <laughs> I saw how dumb I was. But um, anyway, so he let me play, but I couldn't have any anything to drink. Oh. Um, but whatever. Anyway, so um, but uh, you know, it it was it was a great time, but that's um, uh, you know, when um when uh we started changing direction, we got a new guitar player in who was in a, um some really great LA bands called uh, one was called Damn Yankees, not the stupid Ted Nugent crap. Um uh 48 crash was another group he had um i think before that he was in a group called the love loved ones and um and some really great um la power pop stuff you know and an amazing guitar player and so it started to get you know we're going to do this and we're going to be serious you know mm -hmm. but that's when the call from my buddy will um from cat house came and said he was going to audition for nasty suicides band right now, um, had you already become acquainted with Nasty and Timo and um, Alvin by by the time you heard about that? No. So, well, I mean, I met I met all of them at a Cherry Bombs show up in Portland um, uh, in '86, and um, <clears throat> I told that story recently about you know mistaking Timo for Andy and and Timo kind of getting a bit pissed off about it. And uh, but then he was super cool and he he you know brought us backstage and gave us the actually I have a um, somewhere on this earth. I have a Hanoi Rocks backstage pass because the Cherry Bombs didn't even have their own passes at that time. They were using old Hanoi ones, ones and oh. um, like leftover, you know, from Hanoi tours. And um, 
so uh, that was a prized possession for a while. I have no idea where it is now, but um, anyway, so no, so I went back and, you know, got to meet everybody. They were all super cool and, and um, they did a great show. And then, you know, it was like a couple, like a few months later, I was living down in Midway City, you know, and then doing my own thing in Los Angeles after about, you know, about eight, six months, uh, eight months later. And, um, but then no, that was about a year and a half later when I finally, it was like 80, late 88, I think, something like that when I first met them. And, um, and it was Mike Finn in the band at that time. Um, and they had a drummer. Um, I, I think it was some guy from Philadelphia. It was all kind of mixed up with the Johnny Thunders connections and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so they had that guy, but I don't think they were super happy with him. He was more of a heavy metal guy, I guess. And, um, and uh, you know, and apparently what was going on was I think the management um, didn't, were, they weren't too keen on Mike. You know, Mike was, had blonde hair and, you know, um, I don't know what the, I don't know what it was. This is what I heard was that basically they wanted four guys with black hair, you know, four guys with, you know, and I had the long black hair, wore the velvet coats and all that stuff, you know, whatever. So I had the look and, you know, and uh, so they wanted four of those, you know, cause they wanted us to look like everybody else apparently, you know? And so, uh, which we didn't, you know, at, at that time. And, and um, so anyway, so my friend Will gets a call from them to audition and so he called me up because they didn't have a drummer. They needed somebody to sit in. And so I just went along to sit in. I wasn't auditioning, you know, and because um, I was, you know, happy with the couch sluts and, you know, was going to do that. And um, but, um, you know, once we started playing and, you know, Nasty had all these songs written and, you know, and, and we didn't play. And what's funny was my friend Will borrowed all my Hanoi Rocks records to learn a bunch of Hanoi Rocks songs. We didn't play any. It was all just Nasty's material, you know, because he was trying to put together his band. He was trying to shake that that whole thing, you know. Um, and you were able to pick up the songs pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a talent I have. You know what I mean? I can I can sit in and, you know, once somebody starts going, I can, you know, kind of figure out where it's going. And, you know, and um, <clears throat> so, yeah. And so that was it was crazy. So, we you know, we we, we rocked out for a couple hours and um, my friend packed up and they kind of, you know, Timo and Nasty come over and said, hey, you know, you want to go get a, get a drink? And so I said, yeah, sure, you know, it'd be great to hang out with you guys. And, you know, sh you know, and at that point in time, I thought we were just, you know, going to have a drink as buddies or something, you know, and, and I had no idea what, what they had in mind. And so we went, um, I believe it might have been El Compadre and, uh, you know, um, either that or La Via Taxico, that was a, another fave. And, um, and they said, hey, you want to be in the band? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know sure oh what a and cool then story. And, and so then we immediately you know they had shows lined up I you know we went to rehearsals and and um it was a shorter set I think at that time you know there you know there were a couple of covers at one at one time we we worked up uh Clock Strikes 10 by Cheap Trick and we, I think we made it sound pretty good and and um, I don't know if we ever did play it live but um yeah it was it was a lot of fun you know and and um immediately started playing the clubs around LA you know and uh, San Francisco went up, played the Stone, and you know um, San Diego, and uh, you know those kinds of places, and um, it was a lot of fun, you know. And and um, but then you know Nasty got deported. So now um, looking back at it, comparing it with your experience with Cat House prior to that, um, you mentioned how even when you were in Cat House, you kind of sensed it was going to be something that wouldn't quite go anywhere. Did you automatically have a good feeling when you were in Cheap and Nasty though? Like this is a special band. We really could make, make a success of this if we want to. Yeah, I mean, it was um, it was like, a, well, there was already label talk. You know what I mean? There were, I mean, there were people who were already interested just by the virtue of, of the pedigree of the group. I mean, Mike mm -hmm. was in this fantastic band called The Unforgiven. I don't know if you've ever heard them, but um, they were amazing. And, and, and that's another one where like, you know, I was as a kid in Salem, Oregon, I had the Unforgiven's album, you know, wow. and, and so now I'm, you know, down in LA playing with this guy from the Unforgiven. I'm like, I'm just like, damn, you know, um, Cherry Bombs, you know, Hanoi, Unforgiven. I mean, you know, who, who what's, I'm pinching myself, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so no, it was, it was, you know, it's one of those things where there was already, you know, chatter and, and, um, you know, we were just out doing our thing. And then, um, uh, you know, Columbia Records actually did, did gave us some money to go and do some demos because they were interested. And um, uh, uh, there was a guy um, 
from Geffen that was interested. And, you know, there were some other folks, you know, a lot of gun, Guns N' Roses folks, you know, were, were interested and, and probably because of the Uzi suicide deal and, you know, all that kind of stuff too. And the pedigree of the group, you know, and, and um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And um, looking at the scene as a whole for a minute, um, were there any bands in that scene where you watched them for the first time or the first couple of times and just said, they're gonna be legends if they play their cards right? Well, you know, I mean, I, I kind of came in at the tail end of when people started really taking off, you know? So, I mean, um, Guns N' Roses had pretty much already made it, you know? And um, there, were, there were a lot of bands that I would have I would have bet on that um, unfortunately um, there was like a feeding frenzy, you know, with labels and they were giving everybody a deal, you know? And so, um, what, but what they didn't do is they didn't develop anybody. But there was some great stuff going on back there, you know, back then, like, you know, like the hangman who are still going, you know, and, and still making great records. And, um, you know, the sea hags uh, were great. Um, Flies on fire. Uh, you know, there were some really, really great, um, really great bands. Um, you know, none of them, I don't a, a Burning Tree, I would have thought would have, you know, set the world on fire. Broken Homes, too. You know, both of those bands, it was like, you know, um, for me, you know, it just as a as a, a music enthusiast, you know what I mean. I mean, I I thought that that was criminal, you know that 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 those bands didn't you know do do more. And but they were both on major labels, you know, and that just kind of shows you the you know where, um, you know when you're on something like Epic, um, and I can't think of a big Epic band at the moment, but you know all the money is going to go into you know them, and if you're on MCA, all the money is going to go into you know. Um, whatever commercial artists you know it, it, and so you're you're just going to get ignored and overlooked unfortunately you know yeah and i think that's what happened to broken homes uh, and i think that with broken homes too mca never really figured out a good way to promote them and to push them and to really tell people what give people a good idea of how of what type of rock and roll their music was you know in my opinion they were too good you know, I mean, they their their songs are as good as Springsteen's, you know. But but I think you're right. I mean, I don't I don't think that they knew how to um to to really to push them, um as far as like you know to break them commercially, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an odd time to you know. I mean, and then what's interesting is then you get Craig who goes and joins Lenny Kravitz's band, and Lenny Kravitz is enormous, you mm -hmm. know. And and you know no disrespect to Lenny Kravitz, I mean he's he's a fine musician and and but but as far as I'm concerned, the Broken Homes were a hundred times better, you know. And um, but but you know what are you gonna do? I mean there's you can focus on Lenny, you know what I mean, and and you can sexually and all that kind of stuff you can sell him as a product. Mm -hmm. Mike Doman, good looking guy, he looked a lot like Bob Dylan you know, and um, I think he probably got sick to death of those comparisons, you know, um, maybe yeah. didn't, it wasn't the focal point, you know, that, um, that they could, you know, that they could kind of hone in on and put him on posters and, you know, and, and they were a band, you know, and I think that that makes a difference, you know what I mean? Um, when you're a band, you know, it's, um, there's, there's more than one thing to sell, you know? Yeah. And, so. and I mean, they didn't look as crazy as a band like Poison and they weren't as anthemic and as commercial as a band like Ron right. Jovi. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I think, you know, um, but I think that they were as anthemic as Bon Jovi. I think the songs were there. I think it had probably had more to do with that polished, you know, once again, Bon Jovi, you can put him on posters with his shirt off, you know what I mean? And, and girls are going to go nuts. And then, of course, you know, whatever, the guys are going to go nuts because the girls are going nuts. And then, you know, they're going to sell a lot of records. And, I, you know, so I don't, for me, honestly, the production on, on especially like, you know, um, uh, of course, I'm going to blank on the name of the, the, the third album. Um, uh, uh, Wing and a Prayer. Wing and a Prayer. Wing and a Prayer. Thank you. <laughs> the production on that record is insane. You know, and, and they were experimenting with, you know, like downtown culture and, you know, and, and the themes on that record are, were so timely. And maybe that had something to do with it, too. You know, I mean, it's kind of a political record, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, but it's it's thinking man's music, you know, and, and I think that's probably what drew, you know, drew me to it was that, you know, there was substance to it and it wasn't um, you give love a bad name, 
you know, um, yeah, which is fine. I mean, I don't have any beef, you know, against Bon Jovi or, or whatever and his success, but that's pretty benign, you know, nonsensical crap. Yeah. In comparison, you know. Yeah, I mean, Bon Jovi is kind of fun standard rock in terms of its thematic elements, whereas you're right about Broken Homes, it was more of a thinking man's type of music. Yeah. So, you know, so there were a lot of groups, you know, around that at that time, a lot of them, you know, we were playing the same clubs, you know, and, and, um, and I was out every night of the week seeing somebody, you know, there's a really, back then there's a really, there was a lot of bands called that had house in their name. There's a really great band called Fun House. Um, and uh, that were, and, and uh, Chris Hazard is, is still making music today is making great stuff. And, um, you know, of course, you know, Jet Boy, um, criminally overlooked. I mean, they, they, you know, should have been huge and, and, um, and talk about anthemic, right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so there was like, you know, there was some really good stuff going, going on, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's just, it's the, you know, one of the, having been involved in, in the business, but when I was involved in the business, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things that's always kind of, you know, um, confused me a little bit. Were you disappointed that Mike didn't end up going with the band when you guys had to go to England after Nasty got deported? Of course. You know, I mean, Mike was a good friend and uh, he's a great player and uh, uh, he brought a lot to that band. Um, these are two completely different bands. When we were playing the clubs in Los Angeles with Mike, um, it was a completely different band. Um, than when Alvin joined and um, because they're the nature of how they did things um, and uh, it was a way more straight up you know down and dirty rock and roll band you know when we were in in, in LA um, and uh, and then you know one and anyway I'll get back to your question um, yeah Mike you know we loved Mike and I loved Mike and and I you know I but we totally, we totally understood where he was coming from. You know what I mean? He had a career, he had a wife, you know, and um, he just, he, did, he wasn't into it, you know, and, and um, he didn't want to live in England. And so I, I was 22 years old and, um, you know, Mike's a fair bit older than I am. And um, so when uh, I got the opportunity to go over for three months to go record those Columbia demos, you know, I just was enamored with London and I was sick to death of Los Angeles anyway, you know, and I, I picked up some pretty nasty habits in LA that, you know, I was trying to get away from and, and um, you know, so it was, it was a good thing for me. And then to go from like, you know, LA, which is uh, in a sense, kind of culturalist. I mean, it, it, it's not, but, but it kind of was back then mm -hmm. um, to London where, you know, it's just, it's old and you've got museums everywhere you go and you know and and um and so yeah I was like that that was an awakening for me you know and um and it was so nice to like you know just to I lived like a couple of miles from the Tate you know so I'd walk I'd walk down to you know to the Tate and go take in whatever's on you know exactly it sounds like you embraced the opportunity to travel a bit like yeah. I um, my understanding is that you didn't travel much when you were growing up and now you were living in England you were facing the prospect of traveling around the world just it was the perfect opportunity for you absolutely yeah no I mean I traveled between Alaska Oregon and California but you know I had never been out of state you know so uh, when I got to go over there um and uh it was just, it was a completely, you know, um, different thing, you know, completely different vibe. And it's a city, London's a real city, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's not sprawling in the, in the same sense, you know, that Los Angeles is, they've got fantastic public transportation or did anyway, um, back then. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a city in the, in the sense of, of that kind of thing, you know, it's just more urban, you know, and, exactly. um, you know, so, and and yeah and, and and any opportunities I had to broaden my my mind and, and experience, I welcome. Excuse me, sorry. Excellent. Alrighty. Um, describe the first days of cheap and nasty and um, moving to England after that. Did it really still feel like you guys were becoming a family and moving towards the goal of making the band as as successful as it could be? Yeah, I mean, what was cool was like, I knew Alvin before, um, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, he was in like Broken Glass, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. I hung out with him and we had mutual friends and, and uh, he was a great guy. And so 
uh, working with him, uh, you know, even just to go over and do those demos and, and um, working with him as, as a musician was super easy. Like we, we gelled like immediately. Um, by that time, you know, uh, Timo and I were like, you know, inseparable and, and, um, and Nasty was a, a good pal too. And, and so, um, yeah, it, it was, um, we were all uh, pretty, very, very dedicated to that thing, you know, to what Cheap and Nasty was. And, and um, you know, we all kind of went about it in our own ways, um, but we spent a lot of time in each other's company. You know, we were always, you know, Tim and I generally lived together apart from, I mean, we were both married and, and um, at, at that time, um, uh, and so we, or had girlfriends or whatever. So we usually you know, would live with them and whatever. And then we'd all kind of converge at somebody's place. And um, so we, you know, we were always individually doing our own thing, you know, and, and, and writing. And I was always writing with other people too, because I couldn't sit still. And, and, and back then, you know, Cheap and Nasty didn't work a lot um uh because they um the, the feeling was just that we weren't going to do it unless it was on like a certain level you know what i mean nobody wanted to slog around uh in a transit van except me and timo uh so we were overruled and um because uh, i wanted that that experience you know i was young and i'd never had it of, of traveling around through the different countries in a uh in a uh, transit and, you know, Nasty and Alvin both had, and Alvin had just come off the Iggy Pop tour where, of, co of course, you know, he's like living in luxury, staying in, you know, grand hotels and, you know, and, and um, there was a lot of money behind that, whereas we didn't have that really. Mm -hmm. But so, but we made that decision that, you know, we're going to do it if we can do it right. And um, so, uh, you know, we did a, we did some national tours and, and, um, you know, the first, uh, you know, first um, tour, I remember we did, um, there was hardly anybody there, you know, nobody knew who we were, there wasn't any, you know, any real promotion, we were essentially riding on the backs of Nasty and Alvin's names, nobody knew who I was, I mean, I remember seeing a, you know, a Kerrang thing where um, there was this one uh, uh, journalist, um, uh, well, I'll put that in quotes, um, that I remember him like kind of making fun of the fact that, you know, Timo and I were, you know, kind of lesser known or whatever. And she's like, who are these guys kind of thing? It's just like, whatever, dude, wow. you know, who are you? But, you know, but it was just that anyway. Um, but That's so, fun. so Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it was just, well, the guy always wrote himself into the story. He was one of those guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah, but anyway, um, uh, so yeah, we you know we were always kind of around each other, writing stuff, rehearsing stuff, getting ready to do stuff, you know, and um, and so it was always very easy. I mean, we never, um, you know, we didn't have you know beefs. You know, if somebody didn't like something, they just say it, you know, but in a polite way. It's like, hey, you know, maybe you could change that to you know a D chord or whatever. Or, you know, those words are a little clumsy. You know, that kind of stuff. And and. Um, but we were also kind of, you know, um, seasoning each other's stuff as well, too, you know, so like if I um, brought something along, then, uh, you know, we would collaborate on it, you know, and so there's a lot of collaboration and, um, you know, and just and then there was just good times too, like just hanging out and going to the pub and, you know, and just like um, being friends, you know, like going and doing things socially, you know, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, it, it, it was like a, a lot like a family, you know, even though it was a business, you know, there, there was a, there was a lot of love there. Yeah. And also around that time, Timo became a father. And um, as you yeah. told me before, you actually kind of became the babysitter to his kids. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, they, um, they needed a night out every once in a while, you know, so um, they'd get me a nice bottle of red and I'd go hang out. And um, I remember the first time I ever babysat their oldest who's now in this really amazing band called The Shakes, uh, doing great stuff in England. And um, I mean, they're, they're um, supporting uh, Miles Kane, you know, who works with the Arctic Monkeys uh, guy in, in the last um, Shadow Puppets, I think it's called something like that. Anyway, nice. yeah, big, big stuff, doing great stuff, you know. And, um, but <laughs> he was like so freaked out and he knew me, you know what I mean? We were buddies, but when as, the minute they left, he started howling three hours they were gone and he cried the entire time and it's just like I had no idea what to do you know and um so that night I don't even know if I even drank the bottle of red but you know it was um yeah and then after now having my own it's like okay <laughs> you know 
you just kind of try and talk them down and hey it's going to be okay mommy and daddy are going to be home soon you know it's all good let's watch some you know postman pat or whatever you know yeah and never get frazzled or lose your temper with them you never get frazzled or lose your temper it doesn't do anybody any good I mean, I, I don't have children yet, but that's kind of my general understanding if you get into a situation like that with a child, so. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, what, what's, all you're gonna do is make the situation worse. So, you know, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not written any parenting books yet, but you know, watch this space, so. Okay, okay. that would actually be kind of cool. It could be like School of Rock how to parent or, or something. Oh, there like you that. go. <laughs> and make sure you play them as much loud, rock and roll music as you can you know i still think my 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 wife thinks that we we might have damaged um our son's hearing because i took him to well it took her to see the darkness in foxy shazam uh, a few years before he was born <laughs> and it just was like she could feel the bass on her stomach it's like oh. i don't think you're damaging his hearing my hearing's getting damaged and yours probably is too but not his so Fair enough. <laughs> he's a he's a lover of all kinds of music though too. So I think we've done our job well because he's like you know he's he's more experienced in classical music than I am. He knows who composers are. He knows what songs are called. He you know he he's into that kind of thing. So anyway, cool. yeah. Yep. So you've given him a good rounded rounded musical education so far. Yep. Best we can. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, so back in ch to Cheap and Nasty, you've already kind of described part of the process of writing uh, the songs that wound up on uh, Beautiful Disaster, but do you remember any stories or um, any other specifics you can tell me about what choosing what songs were going to be on the record and um, creating them? Well, I mean, it was a, a fairly democratic process. Um, everything that was recorded while we were there, apart from probably some like jams and outtake type stuff, is out there now so you know um so there were some songs that you know for the for the lp that you know um we didn't do and we made the decision not to put mine across the ocean on the album because that had been a single um mm -hmm. but then we decided to keep beautiful disaster on the album even though that was a single as well and so you know um and all those decisions were just kind of arrived at you know through conversation you know it's like um and running order you know, and all that kind of thing. And, you know, of course, back then we had to be worried about um, uh, side one and side two, you know, so you had to figure out, you know, is this going to, when you flip it over, is it going to be compelling? You know what I mean? And so, and I, and I think we did a good job at that, um, you know, but, but once again, that was another one of those situations where, you know, people were able to provide input and, um, you know, it was a kind of a majority rule kind of thing, you know, very, very democratic. So um, it sounds like you arrived like right at the tail end of when vinyl was becoming, uh, I shouldn't say vinyl was becoming CDs, but people were transitioning from prim primarily buying vinyl to buying CDs. Um, was there any, ever any talk about that or did you always approach it as, okay, it is going to be a vinyl album, not just a CD? Well, there's, you know, still, we were still doing vinyl singles too. So, and, and cassette singles. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, record companies do too, is then they decide they, you know, so then we had like the orange 10 inch, you know, so they do these things. And so that people will go out and they'll buy multiple copies of the same thing. Right. And so then they'll chart. Right. And so, um, yeah, no, I mean, we, um, we wanted everything out there. Um, you know, of course this is free streaming. So, you know, we wanted it available on whatever format was available to us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, you know, cassette, vinyl, and uh, CD, so. I mean, for you personally, do you prefer uh, the vinyl format, or did you embrace CDs and then streaming really quickly? Uh, well, I embraced CDs as soon as they came out, um, you know, but but I was still a big cassette guy, too, you know, and um, I it's interesting because I'm, I'm now starting to build my vinyl collection again. I used to have a massive vinyl collection, but when I moved back from the UK, it would have cost me thousands to, you know, to bring it home. So I ended up, you know, selling most of it, giving it away, you know, that kind of thing. So I, when I moved back, I didn't really have any. And so um, I bought a turntable <clears throat> a few months ago and I've been, uh, actually was just at a record store the other day and, and got a few things and found some really good stuff that, um, you know, for three bucks, you know, and, and uh, Dave Edmonds records, Herman Brood and his wild romance, you know, that kind of stuff. And um and don't you yeah. love finding that stuff? Like I found Carol King's tapestry, I think for five bucks recently at a shop. And I was like, yeah, 
<laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's even better when it's 25 cents, but you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And it's just what, what was available to us that, you know, we just wanted it to get out there to as many people as we could. Cool. Alrighty. And um, so one thing that, that uh, I I'm kind of curious about is what was it like when Runge broke right in the middle of Cheap and Nasty's time? Because I know that Timo was a huge fan of Nirvana and some other bands in the grunge movement. But when that happened, was there a worry among you that you would have more difficulty um, finding commercial success uh, in, in a market that had changed? Well, you know, I loved all the bands that were grunge before grunge was a thing. Um, hmm. You know, I was a big Meat Puppets fan, you know, um, uh, a lot of that stuff, you know, the SST records and, you know, um, Minor Threat, you know, and, and um, uh, you know, all those kinds of things that kind of came before grunge you know, um, what, you know, became a thing. And, and so, you know, when, when I first heard, um, never mind, I mean, you know, I, you know, was in love with it. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic record and, and, um, but, but, you know, so was Bleach, you know, and, and, um, and, and, uh, you know, there, there were so many, um, really great groups, uh, that, that came before that. So, um, and I, I never thought in, in, in commercial terms, it was, I think, Maybe the other guys did a little bit more than I did. I, I'm, you know, um, it, it's interesting because you know Alvin, with his punk rock background, um, background in punk rock, mm -hmm. um, I think always kind of thought more commercially, you know, than I did. My background was in like real punk rock. Not saying they're not real punk rock, you know. Don't, you know, make that distinction. But but I think like in true underground music, you know what I mean. I I really truly liked underground music um I, I was that snob that liked stuff that nobody else liked and you know and and stuff that was hard to listen to and you know that kind of thing and and um you know kind of took pride in, <laughs> in the fact that you know it was abrasive and and you know whatever and and um so I think that with with um you know trying to do something in in especially in in hard rock uh at that time you know the whole gypsy thing was gone you know, I mean, the Dogs to More were still out there doing their thing and, and they, you know, they were such a great band and they did what they did so well. And, you know, they had their whole package. I mean, they had the look, they had the whole thing, you know. Um, and I think, you know, maybe a band like that might have been a little bit more concerned about it, you know. But if you listen to um, uh, Cool Talk Injection, there's shades of grunge on there. You know, I mean, it, it's um, there's there's shades of of the sounds and like if you listen to Devil Calling, you know, just the the guitar tones, the production on that, you know, um, uh, which I think is kind of what, um, you know, we, we never were going to get move into that um, territory of like, you know, uh, Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and uh, Stone Temple Pilots and, and um, you know, those those kinds of things that super commercial grunge, you know, um, uh, yeah, we were never going to be able to compete with that Alice in Chains or, you know, it just wasn't our deal. We were a blues based rock and roll band with intonations of, you know, a little bit of heavy metal and a little bit of punk and a little bit of, you know, 60s garage and a little bit of, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I think that our approach was, I don't, we never sat down and had the conversation like, how do we, how do we make this compete in the new market? That was never a conversation. It was usually um, a conversation about how do we survive and exist as a band? You know, what do we need, you know, in order to keep this thing afloat? You know, so, um, and so that's what we did, you know, and we did what we did and we, you know, we wrote the songs we wrote, we played the songs we played, we put, we put them out and, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, Cool Talk Injection was a Japanese only uh, thing, uh, which is a bummer. Um, but I, um, we're supposed to be, I know there's, there's, um, there's a deal um, hopefully being made where that's going to be released on vinyl at some point. Um, so, which will be fantastic. Um, so hopefully that'll reach a, a more people and, and cause you can't find it, you know? And so unless you buy it used on eBay, you know? And, it, and, and, not, and our stuff is wrapped up in copyright nonsense. And so you can't stream it either. 
-hmm. And so um, it's it's one of those sort of unfortunate things that um, I think that this, well, beautiful disaster got lost in in um, kind of similar to broken homes, burning tree. There just wasn't any money behind it. The label were full of shit. You know, they made promises. They broke those promises. Then they just bald faced lied to us. And then you know, so then we were just kind of out on our own. You know, and um, and I'll be perfectly honest. At, at that point in time in my life. I had no interest in the business at all. I didn't attend meetings. I didn't give a shit. You know, I was just out, you know, usually what I was doing was was playing with one of the six bands I was in at the time because we weren't ever doing anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So describe to me what it was like touring in Japan, though, because I know that you guys got a, a great following there. Well, Japan was great. Um, the first time we went over, we went over to showcase um, beautiful disaster, and um, we were uh, there um, because the with uh, uh, Pony Canyon, who was the distributor, um, brought us over, and and um, us and Green on Red, and uh, I think a couple of other acts that were on China at the time, and and um, that was great because it was just a, you know like a press junket thing, and we did one show, and and um, you know got to hang out in Tokyo for a little bit. And um, which was just fantastic. And the the people the people were great, and they were so enthusiastic about the band. And you know, and and um, I don't know what you know about Japan, but like you know, all the they're all bringing you little gifts and stuff, and they're all <laughs> you know kind of thing, and 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 um, just very strange. And and um, but it was cool because you know you could tell that they really appreciated um, you know the the music, and they. Uh, they were um, happy for us to be there. And, you know, we did like a fan club signing thing. And and um, and it was cool because, they, you know, the, the, everybody was just so nice and supportive and, and uh, it was awesome. And then when we went back uh, a few years later uh, to promote Cool Talk Injection, it was a completely different scene because um, it was just, then it was just, uh, there, it, you know, some of the shows were really well attended and then some of the shows weren't very well attended, you know, and, and um, uh, we had a great time. I think at that time, though, in, in the in the band, you know, there were some fractures, you know, there were already some some kind of, you know, um, I was already playing in the Godfathers by then, you know, um, and touring with with them. And um, plus the the other eight things that I had going at the time, and you know Timo and I always had you know four different bands going, and and uh, we were always playing and doing something, and um, so uh, it was you know we came back with a lot of money, which was nice, and um, we got to see more of the country. But the bummer was was that they flew us everywhere, so um, and I, I wanted to take the train but obviously it was much faster for us and much easier for us to just go to the airport jump on a plane hour later you're in you know Osaka or Nagoya or whatever it was and you know so you know we saw a lot of airports and um but the people were great you know and of course Hanoi Rocks had a had a loyal following in Japan as well so they probably remembered that when they um went to look at Nasty's new work Oh man, I mean, there are armloads of Hanoi stuff, and you know, and and that for him to sign, I mean, his hand got worn out, you know, <laughs> mine not so much, but um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was cool, and, and I was happy for you know for him and that, you know, um, but uh, yeah, it was cool. It was, it was a great, great time, and we had, you know, we did some great shows uh, musically. We were really good. I mean, at the time, we were very tight, you know, and and um, as a unit, you know, we played very well together, and and. Um, you know, but I, it was soon after that, that, you know, we started you know, noticing some cracks in the veneer. Was there ever any tension over the fact that Nasty was not able to, um, to go back to America and tour there? Uh, no tension, I don't think. I mean, you know, he, he probably felt some tension and, and, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, it, it was never spoken of. You know, I don't think he ever, um, I don't remember any conversations about how we needed to get back over there, you know, I mean, and, um, but uh, we were, you know, more concentrating on, you know, Jap Japan and Finland and, and, and England at the time. What, what the bummer is, is that we never made it to the continent, you know, and um, which I later got to, to with, um, you know, uh, the Godfathers and that, but um, Unfortunately, Cheap and Nasty never did. And so uh, interestingly enough, I just did an interview um, for um, 
uh, Melody Lane, which is an Italian magazine, uh, recently, mm -hmm. and and um, you know the guy I did the interview with was was super cool, and and uh, but he was telling me that we had a pretty big following in Italy, you know, oh. like a lot of people like really liked the album, and our videos were on heavy rotation on MTV in Italy, you know, oh. and so and we never went to Italy, you know, which is just idiotic because that's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to go where you know uh, people are taking an interest in you. Yeah, it sounds like the label really weren't on top of this. No, I think, you know, you know, they didn't pick up the option. You know, we we signed an eight record deal. We did one, you know, they didn't pick up the option. Um, you know, so I think at that time, you know, they kind of realized that, you know, that we probably weren't going to be, you know, commercially successful and uh, or make a lot of money for them. You know, they had other bands that were doing, you know, much better than we were and, and um but it's interesting too, though, because they had bands like Nine Below Zero, who were essentially like a pub rock band, you know. But um, so, and they did, they did like the pub circuit, you know, and they did, they were great at that, you know, and, um, you know, doing like blues rock or whatever and, and at pubs. And, you know, they, they, you know, hang, hung on to them. And, um, you know, but, you know, it's just one of those things. I think it just wasn't a, a good match, you know, and I, and, 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 and it was um, in some ways, I mean, in all honesty, uh born of a, a tiny bit of desperation on my part anyway i mean i needed money um so and nobody else was knocking so if there were if there was no label war you know for cheap and nasty so it was um you know uh timo and i were are on were on hard times and so when when somebody was willing to you know give us you know some money to play music we were both like yeah you know yeah. And so, you know, the other guys had had uh, income, you know, from other other things. And so, you know, uh, I was doing like shitty, you know, uh, cooking jobs and stuff like that, you know, and I had no interest in, in, in maintaining that life, you know. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, yeah. And I think that that Timo and Alvin kind of got a boost later on, both from Guns N' Roses, oddly enough, when Timo's song um, got onto the Use Your Illusion album, and then mm -hmm. when uh, Guns covered uh, Down on the Farm for Spaghetti Incident. Yeah. And Nasty had Guns N' Roses money, too, from the Uzi suicide deal. That's right. Yeah. So I never got any Guns N' Roses money. Where's my Guns N' Roses money? <laughs> I, I wish that cover, you had some. <laughs> cover Living a Lie, Slash. Come on. And that would actually be really cool if they covered that. I think that Axel could probably do that pretty well now too. I think he could, I think he'd do a good job. Yeah. 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 Who knows? I mean, maybe. Who knows? You, never, you never know, you know? I mean, you know, uh, uh, my buddy Danny used Cold Wind in, in his Johnny Thunders movie, you know what I mean? And, and which was super cool of him. He didn't need to do that, you know? But that was a great thing that he did, you know? And, um, I, you know, I haven't seen any royalty checks from that yet, but they screwed up and left my name off of it anyway. So, you know, what are you gonna do? I actually really wanted Guns N' Roses to cover Right Next Door to Hell as a tribute to Timo at one of their shows after he passed away, but they haven't done it yet. I'm like, uh, guys, he wrote one of your coolest songs. Yeah, you know? well, you know, I mean, who knows what's going on in their minds, you know? I mean, that band to me is like so far away from, from what they were now, you know, um, and, and and yeah, I don't really pay any attention to them, to be honest with you. Well, it's, which is understandable, and I completely agree that they are light years away from what they were in those days, um, yeah. you know, and for me, the, the big thing is Izzy, like, he was the great songwriting, the great songwriting talent of that group, in my opinion, and not having him there is what really made the band suffer, but that's, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> No, I, I agree. And I think that he brought uh, an ingredient, you know, to that, um, to that, uh, that thing that, um, you know, not, there's a lot of talent in that band. You know what I mean? They're all mega talented people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, but I think that what he, the, the thing that he brought, the element and attitude or whatever it was that he brought, you know, that was, was, you know, was realized with the Juju Hounds, you know I mean? What a band. You know, I mean, and those those Juju Hound records are insane, you know. But then, of course, he had Rick Richards and, and Jimmy Ashurst and, and you know, Chalo Quintana, too, you know. So, you know, those guys aren't slouches either, you know. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things that, like, you know, you just, um, but it was a, a much more of a rock and roll thing, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I, before when I was ta talking about 
Izzy, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to sound like I don't think the other members are talented. I mean, I, yeah. I know they're talented. It's yeah. just in terms of like actual songwriting talent, not just performance or instrument or whatever. I think that he was kind of uh, like, kind of what you said, the main ingredient in making those songs truly stand out in that pack. Like he's more, I feel like he brought more of a Rolling Stones type of character mm -hmm. to the songs than the other yeah. people. Did. You know what I mean? I do. You know, and you know who he reminds me of is, is Sammy Yaffa. Um, Sammy Yaffa is like, you put Sammy Yaffa in a band, they're going to kick ass. Mm. I think he's like, Sammy Yaffa is like the bullshit meter, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, like bullshit doesn't get past him. It's like, I think I, what I can see, I've never been in the room when they've been cooking, but you know, what I can see is like some corny <laughs> kind of thing gets put forward and Sammy's like, nope. <laughs> you know what I mean because he's just you know everything that guy touches is gold dust you know and you know I love him as a guy too so that helps but uh you know yeah there's an authenticity to him yeah yeah and just his playing you know his um his, his whole deal you know what I mean so I think that there's you know like what he did what what happened with the New York Dolls when they put those couple of records out that he was you know he went you know he was with them those are great records, man. Those are classics. You know, those are going to live on forever, you know, and, and at least in my collection, you know, I listen to them, you know, uh, uh, you know, often, you know, and the songs on those are just great, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and when he was in Jet Boy and they recorded Feel the Shake, I mean, no disrespect to Todd Crew, I'm sure he was very talented, but I think that Sammy brought some great things to that band when they did that record. Yeah, I think, you know, I never heard them with Todd, you know, I've never heard anything uh, with him I, before, by the time I got down there, you know, Todd had passed on, unfortunately, you know, I never knew him, you know, and um, I got to know uh, Mickey, uh, because Timo and Mickey shared an apartment, you know, and so I spent a ton of time over there, um, you know, and uh, Mickey's a great guy. And um, going back a minute, um, I know that uh, Izzy actually recorded some of Cheap and Nasty's early footage um, when Jimmy came in and played with you guys for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Izzy was around the band, you know, quite a bit. I mean, it was Timo's friend and, and um, actually the first ever recordings of Cheap and Nasty were done in Guns N' Roses rehearsal studio on Izzy's 8-track that I don't know what happened to those tapes. I'd love to hear them. I can't even remember what songs we played, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, he's a, uh, uh, um, you know, a proponent for the, for the band, you know, from, you know, day one, you know, um, so, yeah. Well, if I ever interview him, I'll, I'll definitely ask him about those tapes. <laughs> you have, you have homework. You're going to convince uh, Slash to cover Live and a Lie, and then you're going to unearth the uh, Cheap and Nasty, first Cheap and Nasty demos. Hey, I'm, I can be pretty persuasive, so don't count me out. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was going to say too about Juju Hounds. Um, I didn't realize this until, um, until recently, but Jimmy actually is the one who wrote that, um, the opening line to uh, Shuffle It All. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, if you I, listen to, I mean, it's an amazing song, you know, but if you listen to uh, the Buckcherry album 15 that Jimmy's on, you know, too, like he, He's another one of those guys like Izzy or Sammy that lends this class to anything that he's in. You know, he just has that that ability that he brings that, you know, that melodiousness and that attention to detail and that, you know, strong. He's a really strong player, you know, and, um, you know, but he just he there's a there's an essence to him that he brings to every band he's ever been in, you know, as far as I'm concerned anyway. And, you know, once again, lovely guy, you know. Yes, very lovely yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. First rocker I ever interviewed, actually. Yeah. Was that uh, Buck Cherry Days? Uh, no, it was actually um, when I was working with a podcast, uh, the Guns N' Roses Central podcast. And um, it's kind of a silly interview, but I interviewed him um, about when he made the appearance in Back to the Future. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't get yeah. to write the questions for the interview, but um, it was still fun and it was still cool to meet him and talk about the Juju Hounds and his time on the strip. So, yeah, it was worth it. Yeah. He was another one of those guys that, you know, so, so for, um, you know, I got down to LA and started working with uh, Timo and them, like Timo was like the guy that like brought everybody together. So like, I got to know those guys through him. You know, um, so that whole Stronzo uh, thing was was Timo, you know, like he he was friends with Mark Ford and 
Craig Ross and Jimmy Ashurst and, you know, all these like, you know, um, to me, like just amazing talents. And so like, I just got very fortunate, you know, um, because I knew Timo, you know, and so all of a sudden, you know, I'm Timo's plus one everywhere he's going. And, and um, I got to see it and experience some amazing things and be in the room with like some of the most amazing, amazingly talented people, you know, that just probably, you know, wouldn't have happened you know, had I stayed with, you know, like Cat House or, you know, or Couch Sluts or, you know, whatever, you know. Interestingly enough, all the bands start with C, which I never realized until just now. But, uh, and um, I kind of love going back and seeing his handprint on those bands too. Like I know that he designed the cover for um, for Straight Line Through Time by the Broken yeah. Homes and he also yeah. painted an early guitar of Mark Ford's. Yes, yeah, I, I was around for some of those, some of those things. And, and um, I remember he used to do billboards and he did like set design for videos and, you know, I mean, um, and he, he was always, he was always doing something, you know what I mean? It was like painting people's leather jackets and guitar straps and, you know, doing these cool Timo designs on them and that kind of stuff. And so, and, you know, he was doing that until the, you know, the day passed. And so, yeah, yeah super talented guy. He was. Yeah. All righty. So um, let's get back to you uh, going from Cheap and Nasty into The Godfathers. Um, what was that like? Well, um, my a good friend of mine, who's uh, unfortunately no longer with us, too, um, got in touch with me. Uh, they were getting ready to go on a tour, a European tour, and um, they they had a guy that lined up to play drums, but they when they started rehearsing with him, they realized he couldn't cut it. And so um, this friend of mine, his name is Ronnie Rocca. Uh, was one of the first guys I got to know um, when I first uh, got to uh, England. He was he was just a, a guy about town. He was a roadie for a lot of bunch of bands, but an amazing guitar player in his own right. And uh, so he called me up and he said, you know, if you're not doing anything, how'd you like to go on a six week tour of Europe? Hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not doing anything except for this stupid cooking job, you know, because Cheap and Nasty is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, let's go. And um, so and I love the Godfathers. You know, it was one of those uh, one of those bands that I you know admired and 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 oddly enough had seen them the year before uh, when they it was a new guitar player. It was on the Unreal World uh, tour. They played the Town and Country Club and it was a great show and and um, um, and so I thought, wow, that'd be you know that'd be cool. And I, I like their music and and I like the style with the suits and all that stuff. You know, so I could do that. My hair was short, you know, short by then anyway. And so, uh, mm -hmm. but so I you know I. Um, went and I rehearsed with them and and I think I might have been a little bit um over the too over the top for them you know there's a couple of times where the bass player asked me to tone it down a bit but I told him to go fuck himself and you know said you know you want me to play in your band or you want you know somebody else because this is what I do you know so um I said you know because I love the Mitch Mitchell stuff and, they, and and a lot of their stuff lent itself to like a Hendrixy kind of thing and, you know, their original drummer was, he was okay, but it was all very sort of staccata and, you know, regimented. And I don't play like that. You know, there's flu fluidity, you know, to what I do. And so, um, yeah, and it, it just was, um, and, 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 I, and I, I, I really enjoyed the experience and, you know, um, great guys and that, but I could kind of tell it, it, for me at that time, you know, I was really into writing my own stuff. Um, you know, Timo and I had a couple of different bands go in and I wanted to do that. You know, I didn't want to, you know, be you know, some hired gun in, in a band where I don't have any, um, I can't, I, I don't have a vote, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and as inclusive as, inclusive as they were, um, you know, it was pretty much decided by, you know, the, the two brothers, you know, the singer and, and bass player. And so, uh, and I wasn't used to that. I was used to like, no, I'd rather do, you know, electric flag than state line there, you know what I mean? And, you know, and, and that would get a vote at least, you know, not, you know, here's the set list, you know, whatever. Okay. So, you know, and, and, and it was fine, but um, then they, um, they were going into pre-production for an album. And so I started doing that work with them, but then um, that's when Cool Talk Injection came out in Japan. And that's when those shows got lined up. And so I had to split from a tour that I was doing with them and go uh, do those shows in Japan. And so by the time I got back, they got a drummer in. And so he made the record with them and stayed with them for a little while. And so that was my, you know, um, but I did actually, I think, I, yeah, I did. I went back 
<clears throat> I think in 96 and played some shows with them again, you know, and so there was, I mean, there, you know, there's a good amicable kind of thing, you know, um, they understood where I was coming from because the money I was going to make, you know, going to Japan, plus it was my material that was coming out, they, they understood, you know. Okay. And um, was it right after uh, Cool Talk Injection came out that you started playing it uh, with the Cry uh, with Daryl Bath and the Cry Babies? Um, so that was kind of um, I had played with the Cry Babies before that. Um, <clears throat> that's a, another story I told recently where I my introduction to them was I was um, uh, at a club seeing uh, my my friend and my girlfriend's band at the time, and um, cr the Cry Babies were on the bill, but their drummer didn't show up. So um, Daryl literally got on the stage and said, are, are there any drummers in the house? And I said, I'm a drummer, you know? <laughs> and so I got up and, and um, they started playing like, you know, you don't have to wear boots to be a cowboy, but you got to leave your horse outside, you know, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, um, and I just dug it, man. I mean, it was like just straight meat and potatoes, rock and roll with, with you know, with a sense of humor and attitude and, you know, and uh, Daryl was great, and and um, John was great, and uh, the bass player at the time I can't remember his name, um, but um, good guys, and and so yeah, and and so then we became friends, you know, and so we were kind of in each other's orbit, and um, you know, at one point in time, Nasty and I were both homeless, and so Daryl let us crash on his floor, you know, so we got then we got like really tight, and um, I was uh, I always had my four track with me everywhere I went. So I was like became like the Joe Meek of, of Swiss Cottage, as Daryl liked to call me. And, um, you know, of course, you know, Daryl's, you know, passed on since too, and uh, which is uh, sad. And, and um, you know, but so I was always like helping guys out, like demo their stuff and whatever. And, and uh, but um, so, yeah, we spent a lot of time in each other's company. And um, and uh, yeah. And then when the uh, the decision to make the uh, the Rock On Sessions album was made to bring me and Danny in as um, drummer and bass player. Uh, we went over and I think that, you know, those recordings were, were meant to be demos, you know. I don't think they were ever meant to be released, but um, I don't know if you've heard the record or not, but I have. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it's it's a great record and, and um, that's not me playing on Via Con Dios, by the way. That's uh, I think that's uh, Vom, but okay. um, you know that's a recording they'd done before or whatever. But um, uh, anyway, so you know we went over and uh, we did some shows around that area. It was uh, done in a place called Annecy in France, which is near Chamonix, you know, in the Alps, and and um, just amazing country, you know. And um, so we go play these like wine ski resort wine bars <laughs> and stuff, you know. And so, you know, we're like kicking out this like rock and roll stuff, you know, and, and um, these, you know, to these like kind of, you know, um, French and Italian uh, upper crust types, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you, we'd usually go down pretty well, but then we played a couple of clubs, you know, where, where that was made a little bit more sense. And, but we were essentially like gearing up to do the recording and, and, um, and it was done at this guy called uh, Jean Cataldo, you know, as Johnny Cat. Uh, to us and and uh, he uh he had this uh this great house uh in the in the mountains there and and um and uh he had a studio down in his basement and it was a really nice studio you know and uh everything was there you know and and um it was such an easy um just fun thing you know like we'd we'd work for a few hours and um, he was this amazing, have you ever seen the show live at Daryl's house? No, I haven't. It's, it's like a, I don't know what channel it's on, but basically Daryl Hall invites you to his house. You play music and then he has these amazing chefs cook a meal and then you sit down and have a meal and it's all paired with like really nice wines and stuff. It's, 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 it's cool. Look, look yeah, it up. I will. But uh, anyway, so this was like that. We'd like, we'd work for a few hours and then we'd go up and, and, um, we'd go up to this, like freaking you know repast that was like fit for a king you know and this and he had this insane wine cellar and so like you know it was just it was it was amazing you know and um the only and french wine is tasty too I love yes french wine. very much so that that region of the world produces some insanely good reds but um you know the um and whites but the only thing about that time that was a little bit dicey was they had this huge dog called chucky and um, Chucky was mean, 
And, you know, so if you had to like get up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom or something like that, you had to literally like fear for your life because this dog would kill you, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. And, uh, I tried to make friends with Chucky and he just wasn't having it. You know, he was like oh. their guard dog, man. And he meant business and, you know, but uh, Johnny Cat had this like insane record collection. He had everything you could ever think of in it, you know? And so we'd spend hours up listening to records and playing pool and, you know, then we'd go down and, and uh, make some music, you know? And it was so easy you know, and, and there was no pressure. And I think <clears throat> that's why it was, you know, one of the, one of my favorite things. Um, it was just so enjoyable, um, probably because I, you know, um, I didn't think about it in the same sense of like making a record for, you know, Cheap and Nasty was like, I know this is going out. There's pressure on us to, com you know, to, you know, compete. And there's, you know, all that kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And with the Crybabies, it was just, you know, I, I, honestly like I said I thought we were doing demos I don't think we were I didn't think we were making a record you know but then when I heard it when we all heard it we were like wow you know and then I remember we got back home and we played it for this band called the Gunslingers we were we were going to go do a couple of shows up in um, uh, Boston in, in England and uh, where the Crybaby's original drummer Robbie Rushton is from we were going to play his pub and, and uh, they just all flipped out they're we like because, you know, they had just been there and recorded some stuff themselves. They're like, what the? <laughs> wow. You know, and so, you know, uh, it's just one of those things that just, you know, um, and then it's another another one of those things where like it's you can't find it. You know, we did it in like 96, I think it was. It didn't come out until like 2000. And, you know, and um, I don't even like the, co the copies are literally like in the hundreds. You know what yeah, I mean? it took me a minute to find the the entire album as well, but when I did, it was worth it. I mean, and interestingly enough, you've um, you've called that album your best work. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, I think it's because of all the things that I just talked about. You know, it's um, and I don't know if it's 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 necessarily my best playing, but it was the most fun I ever had in the studio. You know, okay. and 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 in listening to that, you know, like um, I mean, I don't sit around listening to my own records anyway. I mean, who has time? But um, but if I did, you know, I, I can actually put that album on and, and be like a fan. You know, it's almost like I'm not even on it, you know. Nice. You know, yeah. And um, one thing I was going to ask you about, too, um, I didn't realize this until you told me, actually, uh, you were part of the Choir Boys for a while. Well, I did two shows with the Choir Boys. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I was never in the Choir Boys, but they needed a drummer uh, for a couple of shows. And Daryl actually played guitar with them. And um, so it was me, Daryl, um, Guy was actually still playing with them, uh, um, and uh, Guy Bailey, and um, uh, this guy, Willie uh, Dowling, who was uh, in a band called The Grip, and um, he played bass and Spike, of course. And what was interesting about that is, um, uh, you might not know, here's a bit of gossip for you, but um, when, we, when we first moved to England, um, I ended up with Spike's ex-girlfriend, Pam, and uh, Timo ended up with Guy's ex-girlfriend, Helen. <laughs> and so that whole second album uh, should have been called, you know, Tales of Les and Timo, because it's like, it's all about, you know, their breakups and divorces and whatever. And so, um, I did so not know I, that. I'm, 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 I'm playing this song called Take No Revenge. <laughs> And I'm and I'm listening to the words as I'm playing along with it, you know, and I'm going like, huh. <laughs> you know, because like Spike and I were friendly, but we were never friends, you know what I mean? And and I think he, you know, had some resentments toward me, you know, and, and uh, you know, because uh, he and her name was Pam. Pam had been together for a long time, and you know, uh, similarly with you know with Guy and and Timo. Although we all, you know, Guy and Timo actually became pretty good friends after that, you know, and, and I, Guy and I became pretty good friends and. You know, and um, but uh, yeah, it was it was pretty interesting to listen to some of those to play along to some of those songs, thinking like, man, it's probably it's one of those you know you're so vain moments. You know what I mean? Like, is this about me? You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I legitimately did not know any of that, so this is to, totally new to me. And um, I here's the thing: I don't know um Spike or Guy Bailey much at all. I've kind of talked, I've met Spike, and I've kind of messaged Guy Bailey occasionally, but the, they they seem like genuinely good people. Like I'm sure they were, were eventually able to get past that and just appreciate oh, yeah. you guys for the great talents that you were. 
uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like a, um, you know, I, although the album, I think, is called Bittersweet and Twisted, you know, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it is interesting. And what about, you know, Spike being kicked out of his own band? Did you see that? I did see that. And um, I I don't really know what to feel. Yeah. For me, just as a fan, it sucks. And I and here's another thing, like two venues that the choir boys were due to play at have already said um, have already released statements saying that they've had too many people requesting refunds for their tickets and they've actually canceled choir boys shows without spike. Oh, so, wow. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I remember a time when there were two LA guns touring at the same time, you know what I mean? There was like, you know, Phil Lewis's and then there was like, um, I can't remember who they, when Tracy guns had, one. <laughs> they both had LA guns on the road, you know, at the same time. And I remember they were playing, one of them was playing Portland. I was like, you know, I, I, I'm like, who's going to be in the band? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, well, but yeah, I mean, that that kind of wacky stuff goes on all the time. And, you know, I just, it was for me, it was like, how do you have the choir boys without Spike? I mean, he basically is the choir boys. You know, I mean, he's managed to keep that ship afloat, you know, with various members for years, you know. Yeah. And, to, think... and, and to make incredible music too, you know. Exactly. And that's how I feel. Like, I don't know what made the band members yeah, think that they were going to be able to sustain that without Spike as the front man, but. I don't know. Yeah. And, and I just, good luck to all of them. You know what I mean? Exactly. And with respect to the LA guns thing, um, kind of the way that battle boiled down was this, um, Steve Riley, the drummer of LA guns and Kelly, the bass player of LA guns have their own band and, and they call it Riley's LA guns. And then okay. there's of course the LA guns with Bill Lewis and Tracy and um, Mick Cripps is off doing his own thing. He's not in either one. So is he um, the brutalist still? He is. They're um, another little behind the scenes tidbit. They're still together. Uh, part of the reason why they haven't really been playing live or releasing new stuff lately is because they've got a really cool music video they're making right now. Oh, nice. Right on. Yeah, they're making, yeah, they're making a music video with like these little dolls of themselves. Like oh, Nigel cool. will show me pictures and stuff. It's going to be it's going to be cool. <laughs> Neat. Yeah, I'm glad because I really like that. You know, and I was really happy Nigel found something to do, you know, that um, and it was a great record. Yeah. Throughout all this, like, did you ever feel any frustration that a lot of these projects you were with didn't end up getting the commercial success that you thought they deserved? Or were you just uh, all throughout it not really, not really letting, letting that, not really let, letting yourself get too concerned about that? I kind of talked a little bit about our earlier um, commercial success. Um, you know, you, you think about commercial success, you know, when you're, when you're doing, um, you know, when you're creating, um, but it's not something that I ever really spent a whole lot of time thinking about, you know, I mean, um, because you, you, you know, you, you don't really have a ton of control over it, you know, and, and, um, you know, once, you know, you, you create the thing, it goes out into the world and it takes on a life of its own, you know, and, and um, whether people can appreciate it um, or, you know, uh, and, and really, you know, fall in love with it kind of thing. I mean, that's, um, it's a very sort of arbitrary thing, you know, and I think, um, yeah, you know, um, for me, it was mostly about um, just not being able to maintain um, at a level that I wanted to be at without having to have some dumb job, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like I said, the rest of the guys all had uh, other income, though at times, you know, Timo did have to have a dumb job too, you know, he had a family to raise and, you know, so he had to take on a couple of dumb jobs and, and uh, you know, but um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, of course, you know, you put something out in the world, you want people to love it, you know, and, and I think, you know, I stand behind, uh, you know, Mind Across the Ocean or Beautiful Disasters singles and, and uh, the material on, um, on, on uh, Beautiful Disaster as a, when we had that, um, you know, uh, the label behind us, but they weren't behind us. And so that's, you know, kind of, I think we kind of knew, you know, it wasn't a flop by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, it was, you know, it sold pretty well, you know, and both the singles charted. You know, we, you know, we got play on MTV on, you know, things like Headbangers Ball and that kind of stuff. So the music did reach people, you know, I just think that there, it was unorganized and it was, um, and, and because of that, we weren't able to capitalize on it as much as we could have. I think, that, you know, I think if we were uh, allowed to get out into those other markets, I think we, we probably could have maintained something, 
and it probably would have changed the dynamic of the band, you know, I mean, because I think when it um, came time to write the material for uh, Cool Talk Injection, I was writing for other projects. So I have a song on the album called I Know This, and that was the that was a song that I had written for a band that I had with Keith Sparrow and, and Timo, you know, and um, and I think we had demoed that with Dave Trigunna at one point, you know, and um, so I was already, my headspace was was like, you know, um, and I brought that into the band and they liked it, you know, similar with, you know, Ain't Coming Together, like Nasty and I wrote that, you know, on, on my four track at the place that we were living together, you know, and so, um, but we, you know, we just, you know, we, we, you know, and then when we made the decision to put that out as a single, you know, um, it, it, you know, it was only ever in Japan, so I never had any idea or any clue as to how you know well something like that did. You know, what I mean, whether or not it was getting any play or whatever, and um, you know, so. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's for me, it was m more about I just wanted to be able to do it um, without having to have a side job, you know, which is completely changed now after having a break from it. You know, now um, that I have the the career. You know, so it's not just a, you know, a dumb job. I actually have a, a profession, something that I care deeply about, something that where I make a very comfortable living. Um, you know, I uh, am able to, you know, I'm flying down to Los Angeles at the end of the month to go do some recording with uh, Mike Finn and, and, and Jones, you know, from the Unforgiven Hickman, you know, that those, uh, you know, those, those guys, you know, so I'm stoked about that. We're going to record some stuff that hopefully will end up on a cheap and nasty project. That's you excellent. Know, so, yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, so, so now, you know, um, by, by making that choice to kind of not participate in the business as it, as it were, now I just do it um, because I can and because I want to, you know, I don't have, um, that albatross hanging around my neck of that that um, desperation of like I need to do this in order to survive, you know. And I think that that's kind of um, I know you had a question there about kind of what prompted me to leave the business, and 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 that was it, you know. I was um, and I'll tell you the moment I decided um, I was in the middle of a tour uh, with the Godfathers. I was in Austria during Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Austria during Christmas time is probably the most beautiful place on earth. And um, I was miserable. And I was like, and, and I just, I remember being in the, in the, in the uh, van and, and um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the guys and we got a few more shows ahead of us. And, and um, that's when I made the decision. I'm like, I'm out, you know, and I told him, I said, at the end of this, I'm not coming back. And um, I uh, bought a plane ticket to go home you know, to kind of uh, see what it was that I wanted to do. And at that point in time, I kind of decided that I wanted to go back to school, you know, or not back to school, to school, because I'd never tried college, you know, um, at college age. And by then I was like 32 years old, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I, I ended up going to a community college. And, uh, you know, when they ask you, like when your, your entrance exams and all that kind of stuff, they're like, you know, how well do you think you're going to do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I might pull C's. You know, because I didn't do very well in high school. I was not a good student, but generally that's because I was skateboarding, playing the drums and, you know, too busy with rock and roll. I didn't really care about, you know, uh, any of that at that time, you know. And so, um, but I immediately uh, fell in love with academia and uh, uh, was a Dean's List student for my career and, and uh, ended up uh, at some points having above a four point GPA uh ended up going to university on a full ride scholarship um wow. and uh you know uh came out with two degrees and and uh and then I was like I didn't know what I was going to do because my degrees are in English literature and ethnic studies you know so I'm like what do you do with that you know and uh generally you're probably um working at Starbucks you know but I got real lucky and and um and by then, also another um, aspect of that is that I got really involved with my tribe, you know, and um, I, I was taking a language class. I'd drive out from my university to, uh, to our reservation, and I took a, a language class, and I learned our traditional language, you know, on, on Monday nights. And that introduced me some, to some folks um, 
out there and, and um, they brought me in to work on a project to do some copy editing on a virtual gallery project that they were doing at the time. And, and um, you know, next thing I know, I'm like down in San Francisco uh, giving speeches about, you know, museums in the web, you know, and I never, you know, had planned for that. You know, and uh, 13 years later, um, when I finally left working for my tribe, I um, I was the division manager for the education department. You know, so um, I had never planned on that. You know, but I'm, you know, uh, managing 60 people. You know, making six figures, and and uh, you know, wow. I, yeah, I, you know, for 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 me, you know, from my background and my my up upbringing, that you know is is kind of a departure from from generally where other members of my family have gone you know so um yeah it's a huge accomplishment and um tell our our viewers uh what tribe are you from so i'm an enrolled member of the confederated tribes of grand ronde um it's a confederation of about 30 different tribes and bands from basically the expanse of oregon you know so the because our peoples were relocated to um, a reservation in the 1850s. And so those people, my people generally um, speaking come from Southern Oregon. So like Rogue River and Umpqua. And, but I also have some bloodline from the Shoshone Bannock tribe. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Wow, my goodness. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just and around this time as well, you also became a father. Yeah, so my my wife had kids uh, from a previous marriage, so I immediately got the InstaFam and uh, complete with Golden Retriever, and um, you know, and uh, so that was kind of a shock to the system too. I mean, I I had to grow up quickly, and and um, and uh, we just celebrated uh, 14 years together and 10 years married, and our son's nine, and and um, and uh, he uh, he's the light of my life. I mean, you know, it just um, and, and and that so nothing you know uh, no disrespect to my stepdaughters but um they're you know it it is different you know when you have a biological kid and and um and there's that connection there you know what i mean that um that uh preternatural sort of connection that uh inexplicable kind of thing that um you know and he um yeah i just watching him grow is just it's an incredible thing for me you know and it sounds like it would like that transition out of be, um, being a full time musician to academia and your the next part of your career and being a father happened pretty easily for you. Like it happened at the right time when you were ready to embrace it. Yeah. You know what, what's funny about that, though, too, is that that's right when I kind of started getting back into playing music as well. Like I didn't play music for a long time. Uh, I mean, I did, but it was just goofing around in my garage with my my buddies, you know what I mean? And and um, but I wasn't doing anything seriously. But then um, I got involved with the Hickmen. You know, they were going to do um, a show in San Francisco, and so I flew down to LA and I rehearsed with them for a couple of days. We drove up to San Francisco, played a show at this little club, and and stayed overnight at Billy Rose House. You know. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, so I hadn't seen him for years. So that was great. You know, actually, I get to see him in a couple of weeks. They're playing, uh, excuse me, Buck Cherry's playing with Alice Cooper. So I'll get to see Kelly and Billy, uh, both of which I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so um, yeah, and so um, then we came up and drove up, played a show in Portland, and um, and it was great. You know, it was, it was fun to be back in that. Like I said, there was no pressure involved. You know, I wasn't doing it for anything except for the sheer enjoyment, you know. Mm -hmm. and um, so yeah, it was it was good to be back, and and so now I um, like I said, I'm going to do that project at the end of the month. But then I also have my own little band um, that I we play here in my my little mu music room here at my house, and um, you know it's mostly covers. But you know me and the guitar player have written some stuff, and and um, it's a goof. You know, it's uh, for me, uh, I have to enjoy it, and I and I I can't take it seriously. The minute the minute anybody starts taking it seriously, it's like I don't want to have anything to do with it, you know. Um, wow. and, I, and I don't mean that. I don't mean that in in a, in a way to kind of like you know disrespect the process. I just mean that like you know if it's not fun, then what's the point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, me. it's work, you know, because you have to like you know. And I do take it. So if I'm playing a part, I'm gonna take. I'm not gonna try and mess it up. You know what I mean? I'm gonna I'm gonna play my part. You know, but um, I'm gonna. Probably be smirking while I'm doing it. Yeah. 
and you're doing it kind of to to feed your creativity and the part that loves drumming rather than trying to grind and make it a career again. Yeah, it's soul food, you know. Awesome. So um, what are your ambitions moving forward? I mean, I know that um, you've already talked about the fact that you're going to come and do some recording in Los Angeles soon. Um, but beyond that, just personally in, in your career and as a musician moving forward. Uh, so, you know, the career uh, kind of helps propel the ambitions musically. I mean, I just I wrote a song um, recently that um, before Timo passed that I sent the lyrics to, over to Nasty Nasty wrote a tune to it. So, you know, we're collaborating. Uh, hopefully that'll show up on a project. And, and um, you know, it's one of those things where once again, I mean, it's just I'm doing it for the, the, um, the, the joy of doing it. And um, you won't be able to tell by the song because it's a bit of a doom and gloomer, but, you know, <laughs> it's, re it's, it's COVID related. But, um, you know, so I mean, it, but but it's um, it's an outlet, you know what I mean? It, it's um, so it's for me, it's really good to be back to doing that as opposed to not, you know. And for the longest time, I I didn't, you know. And, and so um, yeah, it's just all uh, it's all about a good time. And so um, with my buddies that I play with here, uh, we're gonna do some stuff uh, in the summer. We're gonna we're gonna play some shows locally and. And, um, you know, so we're putting that together and, um, uh, but none of it has anything to do with like trying to, um, uh, sort of promote myself. I've never been into self-promotion in that sense, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, if it happens kind of organically and by word of mouth or whatever, then, then I'm cool with that. You know, it's, I'm not, I don't need the money, you know, I don't, whatever. And so it's, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. um whether there's any involved anyway or not you know um if, if we do this project with uh um the cheap and nasty project was supposed to be a thing where we were gonna uh work with um timo's um uh with becky and um pick a charity to you know to donate proceeds to that so you know that wasn't about money anyway so uh, as long as i can kind of maintain you know because I, I gotta juggle the family life i gotta juggle my career and i gotta juggle you know the creative um, part of that. So I'm just most mostly mindful of like trying to make sure I'm not um, uh, doing too much in any one of those, you know? Yeah. And I was going to say too, it, I mean, this kind of goes without saying, but I was very, very sorry to hear about Daryl Batts passing as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I, really I, I did not know him, but I, he was kind of a friend of a lot of friends and it was, it was just so such a sad two punch for so many people to lose Timo and Daryl pretty much right so quickly. Them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of people in the last couple of years, you know, I mean, some, you know, mega stars, I mean, Taylor Hawkins the other day, I mean, that's a, you know, insane, you know, 50 years old, Mark Lanigan, you know, I mean, just, you know, I mean, there's just, um, and, and some serious talent, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, yeah, you know, and in this business, you know, I mean, it's, it, we get used to it. I've, I mean, I lost a lot of friends from the London days, you know, a lot of them uh, ended up on the needle, you know, and, and uh, you know, once you get involved with all that, usually, you know, Michael yeah. Rove said it best, right? Dead jail or rock and roll, right? And, yeah. yeah. And I, living here in LA, I really see a lot of the effects of that too. I mean, there are certain parts here where if you go for a walk in the morning, you'll see a lot of needles strewn out all over the place. I mean, yeah. it's kind yeah, of nuts. My good buddy that um, was in the couch, let's uh, ran a needle exchange down there on Skid Row for a while. And, you know, he unfortunately got really ill uh, a couple of years back and passed on too. So, you know, but fortunately he'd gotten sober and, you know, it wasn't any drug or alcohol related thing he you know contracted an illness and it took him you know but oh, um, yeah i don't want to end on that note <laughs> yeah we don't want to end on that note like yeah let's end on a positive one um yeah so any other memories to share or things that really stick out to you as but experiences that you're grateful you've had um you know i'm mostly grateful uh to all of the folks that, um, you know, opened their doors to me, you know, and, and, um, and just allowed me to be a part of, of the thing, you know, I mean, um, and uh, some the, this, some of the experiences that I've had, you know, are, are like, um, 
most people don't get to experience, you know. Um, I mean, I was able to go backstage at the Freddie Mercury tribute show, you know, in London at Wembley. And, you know, had, at one point, Bob Geldof was running off to get me beers, you know, and and I'm hanging out with, you know, um, Robert Plant and Joe Elliott and, you know, all these people, you know, and, and just it was, um, you know, I saw Slash there and, and uh, you know, um, you know, just, you know, just those kinds of things, you know, and just then, then just the travel, you know, being seen um, parts of the world and, and, and uh, experiencing things and the people, you know, that just the generosity, you know, um, and, uh, and, and the different languages and, and cultures and experiences and foods and, you know, all those kinds of things that I got to taste and, and experience, you know, during that time that I do miss. I mean, but I'm, I'm headed to New York uh, in a week, you know, um, for uh, for a week just to get out of town for a while and go, you know, get get some culture because <laughs> I need it, you know. Excellent. And, uh, my uh, my wife and I are just celebrating celebrating an anniversary, so we're gonna go over for a trip and. Congratulations and go, on that, by the way. Thank you. Just go be tourists. We're just gonna go be tourists, and uh, it's gonna be great. Excellent. Yeah. Alrighty, and. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I love, and I've loved speaking with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then um, thank you as well. And um, look forward to talking to you again soon. Likewise, you rock. All right. All right. Take care. You too. Bye, Bye. Les.